Hello, everyone. So uh, welcome to our next talk at uh, the Maximin conference. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Lev Sartisov from the University of Manchester, who will talk about computational structure characterization tools for the era of material informatics. Over okay. to you, Lev. Thank you very much, Vitaly, and thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk. To be honest, I have never given a talk in front of a group of mathematicians. And you, you guys, you scare me. Uh, you tend to give very complicated talks. So I thought, you know, I have to take a very different approach. I'm not going to use any formulas because I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake and one of you will correct me and say, no, this is not exact. Um, and I'm going to use a lot of pictures. And I'm also going to take a very different, let's say, uh, spectrum of uh, ideas that looks at the practical application of some of the uh, geometrical concepts that have been discussed in this, in this forum uh, in practical engineering uh, applications. And the first thing that actually I would like to do, maybe slightly uh, different, I would say, uh, arrangement, is that I'm going to make some acknowledgement, acknowledgements. Um, the most recent work on the topics of geometrical tool, tools for porous materials have been published together with a group of Cambridge University, Rosso, uh, Mithili, and David from the group of David Fire and Jimenez in Cambridge. Uh, and this is the first reference uh, on this slide. And the original uh, article on these geometrical tools are published now more than 10 years ago. Interestingly, I'm the first author on that article because actually I programmed it. And Alex Harrison was an undergraduate in my group. He, he did all this kind of tests. Um, so before actually I talk about the tools and how to apply them and what we can learn from these tools, uh, I would like to kind of maybe first talk about what porous materials do we have in mind, uh, what they are and why actually we need all these tools. So the particular example of porous materials that I would like to draw your attention to is uh, meta-organic frameworks. So for those of you who are not chemists, physicists, or material scientists, these are essentially uh, uh, materials built of building blocks, uh, such as this uh, metal vertices and some organic linkers. If you put them in a container that contains some solvent, they will tend to self-assemble in the crystal structure and uh, precipitate as a, as a crystal porous material. And these materials in their current form have been discovered, or one may say rediscovered, by uh, Yagi and co-workers and Ferre in the late 90s. And uh, uh, they really kind of led the revolution in material science because, um, first of all, there are many of these materials that are possible. Um, if you look at the building blocks, you really realize that by small variation of the organic building block, you can create another material. And therefore, if you, if you simply tap into the richness of the organic chemistry, thousands, millions of materials are possible in principle. And meta-organic frameworks is only one of those classes of materials that have been discovered recently that do contain thousands and millions of possible structures, okay? So even if I look at the um, Cambridge crystallographic database, what this, uh, what this picture shows is, uh, this is the total number of, 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 of structures reported in the database and meta-organic frameworks are only these red bars. So they look small compared to uh, the total contents of the database. But in fact, if you look, if you zoom at the bar, uh, it's still, we, we are now in 2021. So we are going to have about 100,000 of moles that have been already crystallized, uh, synthesized and reported. And uh, the number of hypothetical moles that we can imagine on a computer is uh, effectively infinite, okay? So an interesting um, practical question is, what to do with all these materials. Now, uh, this is a picture that is just illustrating the diversity of these crystal materials. They have different pores, they have different shapes. Uh, it is just an example of more than 10 and 20 years ago of these early structures that have been reported. So we have all this diversity. So 
on one hand, uh, this should be considered as a very good thing because if we have all these porous materials, we should be able to match each particular specific engineering application with the material. Uh, and when I talk about the applications, I refer to the applications that capitalize on the fact that the materials I'm talking about are porous materials. And therefore, the applications I'm talking about uh, draw on that feature. Uh, they uh, encompass uh, adsorption problems, separation, catalysis, sensing, drug delivery, pretty much any application that requires some molecules to be inside this porous structure. And then uh, some function emerges out of that situation. So we can uh, look at what kind of application we have in mind and then try to find an ideal material that would actually uh, perform in a particular way in that absorption application, okay? Uh, the practical question for engineers such as myself is how do we navigate the space of real and virtual materials? What would be a way to classify them, to compare their properties, compare their uh, uh, properties, let's say, to the equivalent experimental properties? Um, and then, uh, of course, you know, I'm talking to the group of experts in, the, in, in this field. Uh, we can introduce the concepts of nets, topologies, but also some, uh, let's say, textual features of these materials. And then we can also uh, have another practical question, you know, how do we select the best material for a particular application based on its intrinsic features and characteristics? Uh, now, um, a message to Vitaly, I completely lost all the track of time. So you just warn me when I'm approaching uh, my allocated 40 minutes okay. uh, benchmark. Okay. Yeah, you, you say something, sure. say like enough is enough or something like this. Uh, so, uh, if that if we were able to answer those questions, we would actually make a small revolution in the way how we design applications and uh, engineering applications. Uh, for non-engineers uh, here, basically, what you would do if you wanted to design a new uh, catalysis process or new adsorbent for carbon capture, for example. You would uh, take a sample of a porous material in the lab. You send a PhD student in the lab. You basically try to do all kinds of measurements related to your application in question. And if the material does a good job, then you say, oh, fantastic. You know, maybe I can uh, develop a technology out of this and scale it up. And if it's not working very well, uh, what you do, you, you basically say, well, go back to the lab and try to find another material. And that is our conventional classical, um, let's say, approach to design of the processes and technologies and applications. If we are now have a systematic way to select materials for a particular application, this diagram changes to something that looks now like this, where we conceptually, uh, we do start with a possibly, you know, huge number of potential materials either already synthesized or maybe hypothetical, designed on a computer. And then we perform some analysis of their structure. We learn something about them on a computer. That is done before we actually commit any expensive and time consuming experiments. And then we actually identify maybe promising candidates. So when we send our PhD student to the lab, not with 1 million materials, but maybe five materials, and they perform all kinds of tests. And uh, uh, this, this makes the experimental effort focused. And if for some reason our materials do not perform the way we expect it, we can probably have some kind of feedback loop to understand why our computational screening has not been successful and try to optimize, uh, let's say, the way how we use this metrics or our computational tools. OK, so that would be very, very nice. Uh, but that requires uh, some way to analyze the materials. And the question then becomes, what is sitting inside this computational screening? Is it molecular simulation methods? Is it geometric methods? Maybe it is process level simulations. Okay, so we don't, we don't know yet. Uh, but 
um, the idea would be to maybe start with something simple, such as structural characteristics, and see if there is any connection between the structural characteristics and desired functional characteristics. So a material has a particular porosity, and the result of this, it actually has a capacity to store certain amount of natural gas or hydrogen. Okay, and so in a sense, we are interested in this arrow between structure and function. Uh, and that is, in, in, in some sense, is the essence of material informatics, where it, I call it is a, a framework of tools and concepts to organize knowledge about properties of materials and to link these properties to functional characteristics. Okay, and uh, that's precisely the reason why I speak here, because I think uh, this group uh, represents people who are both interested in the mathematics of this problem, but also in the practical applications. So if we look at the material informatics, it kind of contains of what it is we call structural characteristics and what kind of tools we have to uh, calculate them, let's put it this way. And of course, uh, it is very, this, this area contains a number of very interesting mathematical, uh, geometrical, uh, algorithmic questions, okay? Um, so let me, let me talk a little bit about very practical questions, very practical issues. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm dedicating this slide to all the uh, mathematicians here. Um, uh, so in exchange for what I learned about, about uh, mathematics. So when you synthesize a porous material, you want to somehow say something about it. You basically take it to the lab and you perform some uh, experiments such as nitrogen or argon sorption uh, experiments, uh, which provided the some theories. So it's not a very direct link, but provided some theories can tell you something about the surface area of the material, pore size distribution, possibly the pore volume that can be also obtained from here. And all of these are structural characteristics. And then, of course, using some other adsorption measurements, you may try to obtain equilibrium adsorption data, multi-component adsorption, some transport characteristics of, in this material, all of this influencing how this material is going to perform in the real application. OK. And so what I would like to talk about today is some computational analogs of some of the properties described here uh, and how these properties would look like if we knew the uh, structure of the material. And for some of the materials we do from the crystallography. So what are the character structural characteristic characteristics we're interested in? We're interested in the surface area of the material, pore volume, uh, largest pore size, so uh, what kind of molecules can actually diffuse through the material, uh, pore limiting diameter, uh, what kind of bottlenecks exist in the, in the material. And if you look at the uh, functional characteristics, you may already see some links between this structural and functional characteristics. So for example, uh, this is an adsorption isotherm. So this is how much of a gas adsorbs in the porous material, amount adsorbed versus pressure. And this Henry's constant is just this linear regime of this isotherm at the very beginning. So it characterizes something about how strongly this gas interacts with the surface. And intuitively, you should imagine that this Henry's constant is proportional to how much of the surface area is exposed to the gas that you are absorbing. Uh, another characteristic is the working capacity. So you may, for example, have gas storage application and you are interested in the amount of gas that can be stored in the material. And again, intuitively, you can think that this must be somehow related to the pore volume. Uh, things such as sieving effects of the material, what kind of things can go through should all be obviously related to the selectivity of the material. So if you have a multi-component mixture, maybe some of the components can go through and some of the components cannot. That's very important for gas separations, uh, uh, this type of uh, applications. So one thing that I would like to uh, note is that when we talk about these properties, it's very easy to uh, draw a picture, but in practice, 
there are many subtleties about what it is we actually mean by the core volume or some other properties. Uh, and I just want to illustrate this point. Uh, so imagine that you have a material that consists of this particular atoms shaded gray. Uh, this is your structure. Of course, if we have a molecule that is size of a point, so it is infinitely small uh, point, uh, uh, point uh, molecule, then we can define what I call the geometric volume. So it is essentially all the space not occupied by atoms. And this volume is going to be enclosed by what is called in chemistry the van der Waals surface. So each definition of the volume will have a, a co-current definition of the surface that encloses that volume. Uh, now, of course, uh, the real molecules do not have uh, point size, they have some finite size, and we can define a different uh, surface area or surface. Uh, in this particular example, the surface that is left by the center of the molecule as we roll it on the top of the atoms is the uh, accessible uh, surface. And then this accessible surface is going to enclose what I define as probe accessible volume. And one may argue that this accessible surface is much more relevant to what we measure in experiments if we use, for example, nitrogen molecule as a probe, because we believe that it will form some kind of a film on the surface of the material. Uh, okay, so that's, that's, that's another definition of the surface and the volume. Uh, a slightly different definition of the surface and the volume enclosed by the surface would be the surface that is left not by the center of the molecule, but by this edge. And this surface is going to be called the Connolly surface. And in this case, the volume that the surface encloses is poor occupiable volume. Uh, so that all parts of the molecule are enclosed by the surface and actually from the point of view, again, of the connection to the physical properties, it is this volume that must be most relevant, most accurately corresponding to the volume that we measure in the physical absorption experiments. So we need to understand what computational metrics we should compare to what properties we measure in, in the experiments, uh, okay? Now, uh, another interesting mathematical and topological problem is the delineation of network accessible and network not accessible properties, which is hugely important for practical applications. Um, here I'm showing a very simple example of a network. So you got uh, some kind of a pore, and maybe some of the pores correspond to what is called closed porosity. They just happen to be bubbles inside the pore structure. They don't have any particular access to the world outside. A probe molecule that is shown here would be able to access all this uh, volume and maybe even this volume in this pore connected by a narrow channel, but not necessarily this closed porosity. So for all the practical application, this is a dead volume, not relevant. Okay, so this is a network accessible properties. But from this picture, you can immediately see that the network accessible properties will really strongly depend on what kind of probe you use for the measurement. And if you use a probe of a different size, then some of the regions of the space become not network accessible for this probe. And what this probe is going to see in terms of surface area and volume and pore size distribution is going to be diff very different from the properties seen by this probe, okay? So it's another very interesting mathematical problem. Uh, and then of course, these properties can be compared to let's say total properties if we completely ignore the network connection between different uh, subregions of this porous material and uh, simply manage to artificially place our molecule inside these this cavities inside these regions. And these concepts of network connectivity are also very closely related to this uh, properties that I kind of defined early on um, that are poor limiting diameter and largest cavity diameter. So all of these are uh, properties that are closely related to how the pores connected inside your porous material. 
So what I would like to talk about now is uh, some algorithms that I have used over the years to calculate these properties. And I'm not going to talk about them in detail because it's been published. Uh, it's all on GitHub. The algorithms are described both in terms of the uh, code and in diagrams in the previous publications. But just out of very, very briefly, you know, this is a model of porous material. Again, the atoms are shown as these gray circles here. Uh, uh, the first problem related to how this pore porosity is connected. Uh, for this, you can just divide the system in a, in a, in a, in a set of cubelets and use uh, percolation algorithms like uh, Hosh and Koppelman or some other algorithms to understand uh, what portion of this uh, structure are connected to each other with respect to a probe of a particular size. Uh, Voronoi, Dulani tessellations have been also used for this type of problems. So there's a variety of mathematics and interesting problems that are associated with the topology of the porous space. If we look at, for example, calculation of the accessible surface area, imagine that this is the uh, uh, atom of a solid structure and we're interested in the surface area associated with this atom. We can create a circle uh, like this. This is essentially how this atom is seen by your probe molecule. And we can just perform a very basic Monte Carlo sampling on the surface to understand what proportion of this green circle is accessible to this probe without overlapping with any other atoms of the structure. And that is a very simple algorithm to calculate properties such as the surface area or the atomistically defined crystal structure. Um, another question would be associated with uh, the uh, pore size distribution, porosity, and it is closely related to uh, just very fundamental questions. What is a pore? It is a particularly interesting when you have very disordered structures such as glass or silica gels. Uh, what is a pore? Does this point over here belongs to the pore of the red size or of the black size? So there's some interesting mathematics as well. Uh, and in fact, this type of ideas and this type of algorithms are rather old. If I look at the original papers of Gelben Gobbins, who applied some of these algorithms to the models of uh, silica glass. So we go back to more than 20 years ago and uh, they themselves borrowed these uh, methods and these ideas, these concepts from the field of stereology and applied them to the field of, uh, let's say, uh, molecular models of materials, okay? Uh, what, like, what I would like to do in kind of the uh, second half of my talk is, uh, yes, that's right. 20 minutes, uh, is to talk a little bit about um, recent application of the of this uh, approaches to sets of porous materials and what kind of things we can learn about this sets of porous materials. Uh, so uh, I am uh, the author of the Pore Blazer software, a, a code that I developed originally simply as a hobby, as a just a kind of side project and apparently it became my second best cited paper. Uh, maybe I should take more side projects in my career, uh, particularly with undergraduate students. But most recently, we decided to look at how all the structures look like if they are applied to this Cambridge structure database. And of course, um, uh, I published the Pore Blazer software in 2011, and then uh, uh, Matsei Haranjik and his co-workers, very good colleagues of mine, they also published Zero Plus Plus, which is a very, very powerful and excellent, excellent piece of software that does a uh, similar type of calculations uh, with a slightly different methodology. And one of the things we wanted to do is uh, people come back to us and say, well, how this methodology compares to this methodology? Uh, and I got tired of this and I said, well, is there consistency between different software tools? Is there consistency between the methods? And so we wanted to compare uh, different tools available at the moment uh, to each other to understand whether this, this, this data is, is really consistent. And we also wanted to invest a little bit of time in, uh, in understanding how this type of uh, computation tools can be used for data mining, for visualizing, for discovery of new features, new ideas, new properties. Uh, particularly given that the properties we're reporting 
um, you know, they're, 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 it's more than three, more than four. Um, uh, mathematicians like yourself maybe are capable of seeing more than three dimensions, engineers difficult to see more than two dimensions. So then the challenge becomes, how do you visualize intrinsically uh, multi-dimensional properties of these sets? So we wanted to look at that as well. So we looked at around 12,000 meta-organic frameworks. Uh, and uh, this graph effectively shows how uh, different properties from poor blazer compared to these properties calculated from uh, zero plus plus and what kind of distributions you see in terms of these properties. So uh, these properties are pore limiting diameter, largest cavity diameter, um, accessible surface area, um, network accessible surface area, uh, pore volume and uh, total, and again, network accessible pore volume. And uh, first of all, uh, uh, we've been reasonably happy to see that uh, there's a good agreement between two different software packages, which is very reassuring for the community of material scientists and uh, synthetic chemists. So at least that what they're using is somewhat consistent with each other if they're using different tools. Um, the problems become when you try to compare the network accessible properties to each other, because then you start seeing this type of clouds as I'm showing over here, and this type of disagreements as I show over here. And the reason for this is because how you define the network and the percolation of the network in periodic 3D structures is uh, quite sensitive to the algorithms, to your definitions, to your tools. Uh, and this is where different tools start to disagree. Uh, all the properties that are done on the network accessible subset of poor, poor volume. Okay, so that was an interesting uh, discovery. Another interesting property of this uh, database of porous materials is that actually from the point of view of uh, the distribution of properties, these materials are all very, very micro pores. They feature very, very tiny pores. And so the vast majority of these metal organic frameworks uh, simply are not porous enough to be, you know, let's say practically interesting for chemical engineering uh, applications. And uh, they, they are themselves already a subset of uh, around 100,000 of metal organic frameworks with the remaining 90% of them being even non-porous. So, so, so we need to be mindful of uh, a very, a much smaller group of porous materials that is actually have some practical uh, interest, practical applications. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the visualization of data and data mining and trying to find interesting properties. So um, of course, we have many different properties such as pore volume, surface area, uh, pore limiting diameter, the ratio of different properties to each other. And this is an example how we can visualize this data in a such a way so we build both on two dimension properties, the size of the symbols, maybe the color, so that there are more properties uh, shown on this two dimensional graph. And that allows us to actually find, find some interesting uh, correlations or some interesting properties. So there are some materials that are extremely porous that have a very interesting, unusual combination of smaller and larger porosities that in principle could be, could be used for, for something. Uh, and, and pore limiting diameter is shown here is just the size of the symbol. The colors show the ratio of uh, largest cavity diameter to pore limiting diameter. This is a surface area and this is pore volume. And one of the properties that we were interested in is what if you had a very large ratio of uh, largest cavity diameter and pore limiting diameter, because it would imply this kind of very large cages separated by very tiny, very narrow windows. Maybe this material could be very interesting for some kind of switch on and off gas storage. And this, this is an example of materials we discovered using this data mining and visualization tools. 
that do indeed uh, show this very interesting um, uh, this very interesting properties here. Uh, and an example of this material is shown here. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot make it interactive, but if you rotated this material around, you would realize that indeed it has, uh, it is material shown over here. It has this very large cages separated by uh, very small uh, windows or channels, I would say. Now, what I would like to do is maybe to uh, switch the gears a little bit here and talk about maybe some challenges in uh, trying to connect all these properties directly with practical applications. So uh, from the point of view of the uh, historical detour, uh, at the start of, or at the, at the emergence of this uh, computational tools, they have been a very, uh, very energetic, I would say, very energetic effort to try to connect these geometric properties such as surface area or pore volume to actual technologies such as carbon capture. And this is an example of an early paper in this field on structure property relations of porous materials for carbon dioxide separation and capture. Uh, but in, at the end of the day, in summary, this uh, prop, this, this attempts, they have not really resulted in anything interesting. And the reason for this is because uh, there are too many things in the connection between uh, structure and the actual performance of the material that, that, that are hidden and that cannot be seen just from the structure. And since we are on the carbon separation and capture topic, uh, I thought that I would give you a little bit of the uh, kind of basic introduction. Oh, sorry, did I go out of the presentation mode? I'll go back. Uh, sorry about that. I shouldn't have I shouldn't have touched anything in that uh, in that uh, setting. Anyways, uh, so for non-specialists, if we want to do carbon capture using a porous material. What we do, we have a very large vessel that we fill with porous material. We have a feed that contains nitrogen and CO2. And this feed comes from the combustion of coal or natural gas in the actual uh, power plant. This gas stream, it's a mixture of several gas components is fed into this very large unit that contains our porous material. And one of these uh, gas elements, CO2, absorbs more strongly in the porous material so that on the outside, you have only nitrogen. And that is the essence of the uh, gas separation processes. So essentially I'm giving you a chemical engineering 101 introductory lecture. Uh, as you can see, once you uh, uh, use that unit, uh, it cannot absorb any more CO2. It has to be somehow regenerated. So you close it and then you pull vacuum to remove pure CO2 out of that unit. And then you repeat the process in a cyclic way. And that change of the pressure and the composition in this adsorption unit is the essence of the so-called pressure swing adsorption process that is, uh, it has been contemplated as a promising process for carbon capture. So it is a dynamic process. And because it is dynamic process, it depends on many different factors. Uh, I'm not going to go through these factors in uh, all the uh, uh, details, but the point is that this, the pressure, the time steps, uh, the composition of the mixture are all part of the cycle optimization, okay? So I could have used other values of all these parameters. And the idea would be that you construct a process that produces a gas of a particular purity with a particular recovery. The process has to meet those conditions. And all these chemists in the world, you know, such as uh, the Liverpool group, you know, synthesizing porous cages and metal organic frameworks, they're trying to find the best material that would actually perform this process. Um, and um, actually this is a rather futile effort. Uh, because there is no need for that. The performance of the process at the end of the day is going to depend on a number of factors that are going to be reflected uh, in what I'm going to show as uh, a Pareto front 
that shows the most optimal combination of parameters um, on the on the on the on the on the graph that plots energy penalty of the carbon capture process versus productivity. And that Pareto front does not depend so much on the material, but the, on the optimization of the process cycle. So this is essentially what, uh, what I was talking about. Yeah, this, this type of Pareto fronts. So uh, what my group is currently working at the moment is this type of multi-scale approaches where what we would like to do is we would like this computational screening to be based not necessarily on just the uh, geometric characteristics of the material, but really on what these materials are going to do in the actual process. And for this, we're using process simulations, which is essentially a digital twin of, of, uh, of the real process, okay? And that is the concept that is described here, where we start from the crystal structure we may produce some equilibrium data using uh, molecular simulations. We can produce, uh, for example, grand canonical Monte Carlo simulations. And then this data is fed into the process simulations, imitating vacuum swing or pressure swing adsorption processes. So you can see that the structural characteristics of the material is only one uh, component or feature of the materials that we need to, to, to understand how good it's going to be in the actual process. Okay, what I would like to do here is actually to uh, give a bit more time for the discussion and the questions, uh, because uh, I, I, I kind of feel that maybe this uh, talk was slightly different from uh, other more theoretically focused talks. And I'm very happy to answer all the questions that you might have. I'm giving reference here to the actual software packages, but also uh, all the visualization packages that have been produced to, uh, to look at these properties and visualize them on a computer. And I invite everyone in this audience to, uh, to play with them and to give us some, uh, some feedback as well. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Lev. Let us thank uh, first Lev. <clears throat> Right, so I was uh, positively surprised, but uh, <laughs> despite, so you are the head of department, but nonetheless you implement programs. So this is- I even, I even remember how to program, you would be surprised. Yeah. But, yeah. But, 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 but in Fortran, the language that is not Whoa. readable anymore by any of the students. Even in Fortran, great, great. Okay, <laughs> so I'll stop recording.